Last video, we began our national park circuit. We also stayed the night at a Crackle Barrel for the first time. We visited Petrified Forest National Park where we ate Navajo tacos, then headed out on I-40 East to Gallup, New Mexico to stay the night at another Crackle Barrel before heading to our next national park. All right, we are now in Gallup, New Mexico. We're staying at a Crackle Barrel. There's two other RVs here. Uh, they've all taken up multiple spots, so there's no designated RV spots anymore. Uh, so we're just trying to see where we can get some shade. It is 95 degrees, it's 5 p.m. Uh, we just might call it an early night and then head out super early tomorrow. Yep. First we're gonna walk Piper and then decide what we're gonna do for dinner. <laughs> so she takes priority. We are heading to Mesa Verde National Park. So this will be our second national park on our trip. It's about two and a half hours from here. We have a campground there, so we'll be staying there for the night. And we have a reservation at three o'clock for one of their tours. So this will be the first time doing one of the national park tours. We heard that they're really good. Uh, this will be our first time. No, we stayed at National Park Campground before up in the Grand Canyon. Um, but yeah, we have to go get gas and then we'll be heading out. So today is a travel day and an adventure day. So it's a two in one. The drive seemed extremely long on the super straight and flat road, but there were some cool looking buttes and mesas scattered around and off into the distance. But anyway, Chris and I are starting to get a little bored. We've been driving for over an hour. Oh, I think there's a whole bunch of sheep over here. Let me zoom in. Yeah, those look like sheep. Yeah, we need to take a break. We need to stretch our legs. This vehicle has been in front of us for the past 45 minutes. That's what our view's been. Yay, we finally crossed into Colorado. Now we need to find a place to get gas and stretch our legs. We are now officially in Colorado. Woo! What do you think, Piper? It was a big yawn you just did. You gonna go back to sleep? We entered Mesa Verde National Park and found the campground. We need to check in at the general store for the campsite. In addition to the store, this section has showers, bathrooms, laundry, and a cafe that is open for breakfast with a pancake feast at 7 a.m. This is the map we got from the visitor center. We actually drove up this way from New Mexico, we came in through Cortez direction and then went to this entrance. So the campground is here, Moorfield Campground, and where we're going to do the tour is the Cliff Palace, so down there. So we do have a bit to drive. We have to get up there. So this is lower in elevation. Up here is higher in elevation, and we gotta go on roads that look like this. The site we selected, if you can see all the little roads that are in the campground, we are like right about there. So let's start heading to Cliff Palace. We are doing the last ranger-led tour of the day, but first we need to drive on this road that reminds me of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. This is Jordan, our park ranger guide. He has ancestral ties to Mesa Verde and is from the Pueblo people in New Mexico. He speaks two out of the six Pueblo languages and started the tour with asking his ancestors permission for us to enter the area. Yeah, my name is Jordan. 
but um, I also come from Picaris and Oke Wingu Pueblo in uh, northern New Mexico. So I actually do have ancestral ties to places like Mesa Verde here. So I'm very honored to be amongst you all and tell you a little bit about our history here in this area. Um, and I always like to start off with uh, language because I always think it's super important to start with. Um, I speak two languages, uh, two Pueblo languages, and there's six all together. There's Tiwa, Tewa, Toa, Keres, Hopi, and Zuni. Those are the six languages that modern Pueblo people speak today, and I speak two of them. I speak Tiwa and I speak Tewa. Uh, so I always like to start off with a little bit of something, kind of like get you guys in, um, introduced into this area. For us Pueblo people, we always ask for things before going into site, so I always like to do that for our visitors here whenever I lead a tour. So I'll start off with that before going in. So, Totanakuachipan, Ayaya, Chapelina, Aiha, Ima Tateo, Toya Tataya Tate, Antamena, Taiha, Tolpine, Antiana, and Taiha, Goachan, Antipi Omhe, Mawa, Matawe, Tajinha. So, thank you all for letting me do that for you real quickly. So pretty much what I just did was I just introduced myself and letting our ancestors down below know that we're all coming in and that I will be telling you all a little bit about this place too as well. So that's a little bit of what I said. Across the way, you can see the Mesa Tops. The ancestral Pueblo people grew crops and hunted here. Crops included corn, squash, and beans, and the animals hunted included deer, elk, turkey, rabbit, and squirrel. Jordan pointed out that across the canyon is not National Park Service land, but the Ute Reservation land. With that being said, let's get started. The path leading through the dwellings was a little over a quarter of a mile, but required going up and down ladders, stairs, climbing through a tunnel, and squeezing through narrow passages. The ancestral Puebloans that lived here used hand and footholds from the dwellings to the top of the mesa. There was also hand and footholds from the dwellings down into the canyon. The tour stopped at this spot to explain the puddle that's to the right of us. It's actually called a spring. The closest river was about five miles away. There is no river at the bottom of this canyon. However, there are springs in the sandstone cliffs. Sandstone is very porous and the groundwater from the top of the mesa pulls into it. It comes down into these alcoves where it is used as a water source. When monsoon season occurs, all the water reserves are replenished. If you see these blackened areas at the top of the canyon, on the rim, they're called desert varnish. It is the moisture from the monsoons as it absorbs into the sandstones and comes down into the springs. Oh, and see that ladder? It is a 35 foot tall ladder that we climb to get to the next section. After climbing the tall ladder, we walked along the path and needed to shuffle through this narrow passageway into the dwellings. You can see half of our group are still climbing the ladder. These cliff dwellings were rediscovered around 1890 by local ranchers. There is no one direct answer as to why the ancestral Pueblos left the area in 1300 AD. However, many theories exist, such as volcano activity, overpopulation, political unrest, and years of drought. Archaeologists have evidence that it was a slow migration occurring over years, with a family or a clan leaving here and there. The majority of people relocated to the south. Moving from this courtyard area over to the next section required us to hike up this boulder. There are hand and footholds in the boulder that were used by the ancestral Pueblos. This is how they moved from one section to the other as well. Once we climbed up the boulder, 
We squeezed behind the structures using a skinny pathway that opened up into the kivas. Kivas are ceremonial spaces entered from the top. It is speculated that each family had their own kiva. This section of the park has 23 kivas. Awesome, great. So kivas, the way I like to describe it is imagine that your church, your courtroom, and your living room are all wrapped into one building. You get something very similar to a kiva right here. So to Pueblo people, these are ceremonial chambers. This is where we practice all of our ceremonies. All happens here. Our governing system also happens in here, but also a little bit of daily life happens on the very tops of them too as well. Mm -hmm. So on the top here, you would see women probably painting their pottery. You could see men working um, textiles from posts like that. You could also see people probably um, utilizing it for cultural performances. Here, this is called a keyhole shaped kiva because of that feature right there, that little notch there. Also, another thing in Mesa Verde style kivas is there's always six pillars. So if you count them, one, two, three, four, five, six. And in archaeological terms for um, these kivas, they're um, considered pilasters. So I'm going to be calling them pilasters. <laughs> so we have those there. But also, if you look at my left leg here, you're going to see a little hole. But if your eyes go straight down, there is a tunnel down there below too as well. And that's really important, but I'll get to that here in a little bit. So these pilasters, they actually support the roof systems for these kivas. Right? You have to have a really small fire. But small smoldering fires do a very good job of producing smoke. So if you have one, um, one hole right above the center and you have a lot of smoke, it cannot go anywhere if you have that, just that there. So this vent, or this tunnel is a vent. So that would help push out a lot of the smoke. And that wall that you see there, that's called the deflector. So once fresh air comes in from the east here, uh, um, from the mouth of the alcove, and it goes in there and it hits that deflector wall, it does exactly what it, the name is, it deflects air. And what happens? But with that being said, I'd just like to say Ta'ach and Aho, thank you all very much for joining us today. And if you have questions, let me know. But Ta'ach and Aho, thank you all for being here today. This tunnel was the exit. It was the actual original entrance and exit of the dwellings when people lived here. The way we came in was constructed by the park services. Jordan was an incredibly informative and excellent guide. You could tell he was excited to share his knowledge about the dwellings and the ancient Pueblo peoples. After climbing this ladder, going up a bunch of steps, and then climbing another ladder, we finally reached the top and that climb was a bit of a workout. I can see why it is used as the exit and not an entrance. This would be really hard to climb down. We jumped back into the vehicle and drove the Mr. Toad's Wild Ride Road back to the campground. You reserve your spot, but then it's first come first serve to pick out your spot. So you reserve that you're gonna be here for the night. This is the one we picked, 6.30 at night. The sun is way over there setting, so, I mean, we're not shaded by trees. We turned off the air condition, turned off the engine. There's a nice breeze going through. It is 86 degrees out. It's supposed to get down to 61 tonight. Hi, Piper. She already ate. <laughs> So here's the map they gave us and I'll show you what we did. So here is the campsite store. So it's nice that there's one dump station, two dump stations. Then they do the group camping. So I guess that's like for like Boy Scouts or something. Then they come up here. This is all, I believe tents, same with here. And then these are the sites for, oh, this is the full hookups. So ours is a dry spot. This is all generator, but we are sitting right about here. But each site has plenty of space. So that's one place to park. You're allowed to have two tents per spot or two vehicles per spot if they fit. And most spots have a picnic table and a campground campfire's pit.
Chris and Piper are enjoying the evening before we call it a night. Good morning. It is 7.30, 7.45ish. We have loaded everything up. We are heading out. We're gonna go to the camp store. They have a pancake breakfast from seven to 10. It, last time I looked at the temperature, it was 56 degrees. Uh, we slept with no air conditioning on last night. We actually had the back windows cracked and the overhead fan on and it pretty cold. Yeah. Not freezing, comfortable. We had blankets and we were nice and comfortable. Now we sweatshirt and pants probably for like the next two hours and it'll be hot that we can switch back to shorts. We didn't stamp our passport, so we'll get that. And then we're gonna head to our third destination, which is Durango. We're gonna stay there for a couple days, but no national parks there. So I guess here we go. We stamped our National Park passport and wrapped up our time in Mesa Verde National Park. This is National Park number two being checked off our list. Time to hit the road and head to Durango. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe, like, and leave comments. Take care. Bye.